our grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, the story of Jonah is really a, a fantastic one, although being in the belly of the whale is really far from the most important point in this story. The point is really about repentance, revenge, and reconciliation. Jonah is sent to preach to Assyria, to the Assyrian capital of Nineveh. Nineveh was not a good place, particularly if you were a devout Hebrew. Uh, the Assyrians were exceptionally brutal, and this is, they're exceptionally brutal in a time when it was already much more brutal than it is today. Intimidation, bullying, and executing your enemies filled politics more than elections or accusations. The foreign policy of the Assyrians was pretty simple. Kill them, assault them, or chain them up and march them off. Uh, from the perspective of God's people, the Assyrians were clearly the bad guys. Um, eventually, in fact, they were going to destroy the homeland of Jonah, where Jonah lives, the northern kingdom of Israel. They would basically erase the kingdom of Israel and the ten northern tribes from the pages of history. It would kind of be like if the Holy Spirit called you or I to go and preach to, say, ISIS. The Assyrians, they kill people just for getting in their way, sometimes just for fun. And Jonah is supposed to tell them to repent and to change? Nineveh reveled in violence and destruction. Why would they listen to a prophet from a subjugated people. It's really no wonder when you consider the background that Jonah got in a ship sailing in the opposite direction. However, the Lord, it turns out, is a, a far worse enemy to have than any foreign power. Uh, Martin Luther, the reformer, put it like this. He said that having God on your back is that feeling as if God's your enemy or he's out to get you, he said that's far worse than anything the devil can do. And by the way, the only way to get God off your back, Luther said, is to turn around and face him, repent, and fall on his mercy. If Jonah had had any doubts before, he quickly learned that God, to use Jonah's own words, that God is indeed the God of heavens, who made the sea and the land. A great wind and tempest overtakes the ship that Jonah's on, and, and even these Gentile sailors recognize it as the judgment of God. When the lot falls on him, Jonah tells them, the only way out is to throw, the, is to throw him into the sea. The storm dies down, and the sailors recognize that God is at work, and they feared the Lord, we're told, and they praised Him. Um, these pagan sailors repented and honored Yahweh, but we'll find out Jonah is not done testing the Lord. Like Jonah, God's people often fight Him or even get in His way. Now, this is an important point that we can learn from Jonah and his God's interaction with Assyria, God's desire is not really to punish the nations. But what God does want is a fair world. Uh, he wants to prevent abuse and wickedness. And, you know, granted, he'll do it the hard way if people won't accept the easy way. But Yahweh doesn't want to destroy anybody. Rather, he wants repentance and then he will happily forgive. Uh, Jonah, at this point, is glad of God's far-reaching mercy, that even though he's in the belly of the whale, and because he's in the belly of the whale, he's been saved. He praises the Lord for the Lord's mercy, and he repents. You heard my prayer, and you had mercy on me, even though I was not listening to you. Well, Jonah is, to put it nicely, regurgitated back onto the beach, and he now decides maybe it would be idea, a good idea to go to Nineveh. And so he goes to the city telling them to repent because in 40 days Yahweh was going to destroy the city. And really shockingly, 
this goes over exceptionally well. The news of this reaches all the way to the king of Nineveh who tears his royal robes and puts on uh, sackcloth and sits in the dust. What's more, he may, issues a decree that the whole city, including beasts as well as people, repent of their violence in hopes that God would have mercy on him. Well, Yahweh does have mercy on them. Jonah goes up on a hill hoping that God would change his mind and destroy Nineveh anyway. And this time, unlike when he was saved, Jonah is now not very pleased with God's mercy. And it turns out that this is what had caused Jonah to sail in the wrong direction. The beginning of the story, if you know anything, most of us don't until we're told, but if you know anything about the background, the beginning of the story really leads most rational listeners to assume that Jonah must have run because he was scared. But when Jonah get, when God gets Jonah all worked up by pardoning Israel's nemesis, we hear the truth that Jonah blurts out. I knew it. I just knew it. As soon as I heard that this was my mission, I knew exactly what would happen. You forgiving and merciful God, it makes me sick. Just kill me now. You want to know why I was so quick to flee, Jonah says? It's because I knew you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity, and I just could not stand it. In other words, Jonah wasn't scared of Nineveh or God's wrath. He was angered by God's compassion. Jonah, pouting all the way, climbs up on a hill, hoping God will be moved by his whiny little speech to send meteors or, or something to burn up the city. But the only thing burning up, it turns out, is Jonah under the hot sun. Well, the Lord has pity on this pathetic and bitter Israelite, so he sends a fast-growing vine to provide him shade. Uh, then the vine dies as quickly as it has grown, and Jonah throws a hissy fit. I can, I can just hear Jonah moaning, can a guy even watch his enemies burn in the shade? Kill me now, Lord. Now that my enemies are still alive, I have nothing to live for. And God asks, do you really? have a right to be angry about this vine? And Jonah replies, yes, angry enough to die. And he says, for the third time, fourth time, if you count him telling them to throw him into the sea, God replies, you're all worked up about a vine that you did not plant or water or take care of in any way. Well, there are over 120,000 people and cattle who live in Nineveh. Do I not have a right to care about that, their welfare, and that's where the book stops. One thing that we can clearly learn um, from this story is that um, ve seeking vengeance and retribution is really incompatible with living at peace with a merciful God. Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord, and I will repay. And, and Quite often, frankly, he chooses to have mercy rather than repay. Sometimes he does give people what they deserve, but as Christians, we have to leave it to his discretion, not to our desires. And as God's people, if our primary concern in church is getting back at others, obviously I think we've already lost. Church is not about winning, it's about what we're introduced to in our gospel lesson, God's kingdom. God's kingdom, which is, as Jesus says in his very first words in the gospel of Mark, about repentance and trust. We win, we learn as Christians, when we lose. When we give up on our selfishness or our own desires, and instead we repent and lean upon God's word, and the promises of Jesus. Sometimes the best moments for us as Christians is when our plans come to nothing. Because church, God's kingdom, it's really not about you or me. It's about Jesus. It's about listening to the 
Holy Spirit instead of listening to my flesh. It's about victory through nothing other than Christ crucified and resurrected. It's about the new kingdom, a kingdom of grace and forgiveness. And frankly, God's kingdom is too important to stop for bitter or for vengeful sinners like Jonah. Even even if you or I have been seriously hurt, which sometimes we are, even if we've been betrayed or attacked like Jonah was by those Assyrians centered in Nineveh, God's kingdom won't stop just because you or I try to drag our heels. God's kingdom will come. He will forgive. God's kingdom won't be stopped by anyone because God's kingdom, frankly, can't be defeated. It can't be killed or stopped. God's forgiveness certainly could not be stopped by any power or on heaven or on earth. Um, It could not be stopped by embittered legalistic Pharisees or cold-blooded Romans or pandering politicians or bloodthirsty crowds. God's kingdom couldn't be stopped even by the most brutal of all attacks, the crucifixion, which coincidentally was created by the Assyrians. But that's what the crucifixion of Jesus was, the most epic fail of all time. But it was not, as people assumed when they saw it, an epic fail of Jesus. Rather, it was an epic fail for the Pharisees who who wanted Jesus out of their way for good. It was an epic fail for the Romans who had been pitching a perfect game when it came to silencing rivals to Caesar. It failed Satan because Jesus did not grow embittered. God did not seek vengeance on His people, but rather the Father listened when the Son cried out in a rasping, dying breath, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, God's forgiveness cannot be stopped. Not even when the forgiver in the flesh was publicly humiliated and executed, because paradoxically that was the way in which God was going to change sinners' hearts and show just how merciful our God is. Forgiveness, uh, God's forgiveness is like a train coming down the tracks. You better climb on board or or get out of the way because the train won't stop. But thank God that you and I, we have a ticket to ride, delivered to you in your baptism, given to you at the communion rail, promised to you every time you confess and receive forgiveness. You have a ticket because Christ is your Savior. God's forgiveness is here, and it won't stop. And that's a wonderful thing. Because even your sins, brothers and sisters in Christ, can't stop this train. Your sins have been nailed to the cross, and you have been raised with Christ. So come and join in the kingdom of God, which does not care about enemies, but is rather obsessed with forgiveness and the way of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.